I've probably made hundreds of millions of dollars worth of errors as an entrepreneur. I went from having 20 employees to having 3,000 plus full-time people and 150,000 part-time people in 24 months. We became the fastest growing company in Wall Street and ran 100 million in profit. But all that revenue and all that money, did that not come at the backs and the costs of your distributors and regular people? We got a lot of people really wealthy quickly, myself included. I made a lot of mistakes. I wasn't ready for that. This is Ryan Blair. He lived a real world Wolf of Wall Street lifestyle, except for, you know, the whole breaking the law thing. I'd run my health to the ground, partying, being an idiot. My ego loved the idea of going public. So my requirement was I needed a jet. I needed this. I needed that. They said, deal. We're making all this money, buying mansions, flying on private jets. All that stuff just destroyed the ethos of what made us great in the first place. Is this your chance for redemption? Is this the penance that you're paying? It is 100% me trying to get favor with our Heavenly Father. I screwed up, made a lot of mistakes. You're now, smiling now. Are, like, are you joking or is that no, seriously? No, like, it's the truth. No, I'm smiling because it's the absolute truth. I made a deal with God. My mother uh, had been in a coma for two years. When you hit rock bottom, that's when you really get to find out who you are. And that's when you begin to climb again. Ryan, I am so excited to have you on the podcast because you're known for having lived this kind of crazy, ridiculous life. There was hundreds of millions of dollars at stake. There was drugs and there was partying and drinking and you say you were living this playboy life and yet your latest venture, Alter Call, could not be any more different. It could not be any more different from your past. And so I understand that you're bringing together entrepreneurs who want impact and we want money and we want legacy. Like who, who, what is Alter Call for and what the heck is it? You know, it's a great question. I was raised very spiritually and I lost my way as an entrepreneur. I started pursuing ego, going after awards. You know, my ego got out of control. I became very successful as an entrepreneur and I realized that I'd lost my way. And so Alter Call was an innovation for me to create community with entrepreneurs that identify as being spiritual. We are trying to solve a very hard problem. We're trying to teach entrepreneurs to treat their businesses and their teams and their work as sacred. If you see it as sacred, then you operate differently. And with that perspective, you're able to uh, get through the challenges more effectively. So, I mean, <laughs> it, and what we're doing is for people that identify as being spiritual. And there's a uh, surprisingly, there's a lot of people out there that are looking for a deeper purpose, greater meaning, and they're looking to see their business as a vehicle for them to affect change and make an impact. So if you don't identify with that, that's fine. Like there's plenty of people out there that are only in business to make money and are only in business to extract resources for their own personal gain at the detriment of anyone that they possibly can illegally, right? And then there's people that will do it at the detriment uh you know, the environment, they'll do it at the detriment of capitalism, they'll do it at the detriment of their neighbors, they'll do it, you know, they're just solely in the game for themselves. <laughs> then there's people that have a deep calling to make an impact, and they want to better the planet. Have you read Small Giants, uh, the book by uh, Bo, should you say his name, Burlingham? Have you read have Small not. Giants? Oh, man, it's this amazing book. Uh, it was written, I think, in 2006. And this author... Um, Gosh, I think he wrote for Inc. back when it was founded, like by the guy who created Inc., who was like some kind of hippie sail like sailor. Like he traveled yeah. around the world on a boat and did all this stuff. And he ended up creating Inc. because he found in the early 80s there's all these entrepreneurs who are not the, you know, the IBMs of the world. They're not the publicly traded companies of the world, but they're also not, you know, uh the freelancer. There's like this group in the middle. And so he wanted to see what makes these amazing, what he called small giants, these companies who uh, who put uh, people over profits, who do not grow at all costs, who in fact resist growth, who will not necessarily take on other people's money. And he looked at all these different types of companies and he selected, I think, 10 of them. Like Cliff Bars was one of them before uh, it kind of really blew up and got big. And in um, San Francisco, there's a brewery by the grandson of Maytag, the guy who created Maytag, who ran this brewery. And Anyway, he looked at what made these companies great and what made them amazing. And he called it, um, he called it like the mojo. Like there's like this mojo that exists. And so I 
have so admired this book that I'm like, damn, I wish like, like I keep talking, my team is so tired of me talking about small giants. <laughs> and so it's like, it's like oh, we got to be a small giant. We got to work with small giants. It's just like, I almost feel like it subscribes to what you're saying. This idea that like you can have purpose and you can put people first and you can avoid, you know, destroying the environment and taking advantage of people and all these things to great companies. But I guess my point of view is that um, I think most, like most people will fall into that category, wouldn't they? Like the textbooks and management philosophy were written by industrialists for the most part. And so everything that we know about running businesses and culture was written by industrialists who saw human beings as things to be exploited. They wanted to run them into the ground and they wanted to extract as much of their life force out of them as possible in the pursuit of their own profits and their own family legacy, right? So that's the system of capitalism that we are a part of everywhere. Now, there are a number of people that are breaking out of that system that are saying, I want to do things differently. And I'm not familiar with Small Giants, but I will read it. It sounds like a great book. It, Those it came the people- at the recommendation of Tim Ferriss and Ryan Holiday. Yeah. Uh, now, but I'll tell you that if you, so if you are spiritually inclined and you have a uh, deep desire to affect change in the marketplace, and then you start hiring people and they bring in the industrial version of capitalism, you all of a sudden have a business that isn't operating effectively. You don't receive joy and, uh, you know, love from your business. It becomes a detriment to your family harmony. And if you do it incorrectly, the more that your business grows, the less you grow. And the more pain that you have, and uh, we have all seen this with many entrepreneurs, if you don't architect a business correctly, the more that it grows, the less freedom that you will have. And then you will say to yourself, why the hell am I doing this? Versus if you integrate an operating system that takes uh, into consideration many of the values and uh, practices and principles and factors that I've shared here and that I teach, then you're going to have an operating system that every time you show up to this business, it is going to grow you. And so whether it's a challenge that shows up, uh, an opportunity, a blessing, a big win, it's all a growth opportunity. So I'm just teaching people to see their businesses differently than what the industrial complex has taught us entrepreneurs and business leaders and managers to see business as. Okay. So I am, I'm spiritual. I would say that for sure. You know, my wife and I, uh, when we first, before we got married, so what were we, 20 maybe? (laughs) Uh, we started going to church uh, and we became Christians and that worked for us to a degree up to <laughs> um, about a year or two before the pandemic. And then the pandemic really gave us coverage to start questioning a lot of things. And since then, um, you know, I certainly learned a lot more about uh, what, when I was Christian, we would call the new age movement, but um, I've learned about <laughs> Buddhism and Zen philosophies and all kinds of stuff. And it's really helped open up my mind to the different ways to look at things. So I would say that I'm 100% a spiritual person. And uh, from my Christian background, and then now being able to explore different perspectives and respect different parts of other cultures and other religions' uh, backgrounds, I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm an entrepreneur and I want to have income and I want to have impact. And frankly, like I've realized over the last six months, my number one motivator is my imaginary grandkids. You know, mm-hmm. just turned 40. I have four kids. And through four, four, three or four years ago, I got fit for the first time in my life. I think my audience is tired of hearing this story, but I got fit for the first time in my life. And the only thing I was at a Tony Robbins conference with my friend Evan Carmichael, we're in the front row. And Tony's like, you know, spitting fire and doing his thing. And we have to go through this exercise. And the only thing that got me to actually get fit and lose weight was imagining meeting my grandkids. And if I don't get fit and if I don't lose weight, I would die in my 40s and they would never meet me. You know, I would just be some name. I would just be Mark, the guy who, you know, was your grandfather, but isn't here anymore. And so this legacy, these grandkids that I imagine what I want to give, what I want to give them to, what I want to be able to give to them and the income I want to make and the impact I want to make and what I want to give to my team. Like, I feel like I'm like, Ryan, man, like, (laughs) dude, I am so ready. I'm your target. Like, like, you're selling yourself, right? 
By the way, yeah. you started out, Mark, with uh, some skepticism, and now I hear you selling yourself here. If you're ready to sign up, Mark, I, uh, I'll be happy to you know spend the rest of this podcast taking you through my programs. <laughs> Promo <laughs> code. But yeah. what what does Alter Call do? You talked about what you teach and all this stuff. Like so, so I'm primed. Like like I'm primed. I'm ready. But how is this gonna be different or help me from anything other aside from just being like you know, cool? Like I already want to do these things. Isn't intention enough? Well. No, you need support. You need mentorship. I need mentorship. I spend a lot of money on coaches. I'm friends with Tony Robbins and many. Uh, I've had John Maxwell as a personal mentor. I've spent time with some of the best entrepreneurs to ever exist on the planet. And I found that many of them have a deep spiritual calling in their entrepreneurial work. Uh, Steve Jobs, for example, we all know that it was a spiritual calling of his to create Apple. And Apple is the most valuable country in the, a company in the world, nearly as valuable as a country. Um, there is certainly valuable than more some countries. Um, but that, you know, that said, the things that we do, we have extracted best practices from a number of different concepts like meditation, prayer, and we just try to simplify them and we try to attach them to principles and train people how to simply go about life in such a way where they have harmony between their work and their business and they can grow their business to whatever uh, desire that they have. Um, we do events, for example, and we bring people in and we meditate with them. You'd be surprised how many entrepreneurs resist the practice of meditation, which is brain training, basically. It's basically sitting down and saying, I want to train my brain so that way I can enhance its clarity. I can enhance, you know, I can reduce the amount of stress that I have in my life. And so we're teaching people very practical skills and we're helping them apply those skills to their life and their business. And then when you do that, you start to maximize your potential as you've learned and you know, the working out that you do. I work out as well. If you want to have great energy and you want to bring that to your team and you want to bring that to your customers, well, you have to make your energy system your highest priority. And as entrepreneurs, we don't do that. We do anything but that. The other thing is that entrepreneurship for most small businesses is very lonely. All the people that you surround yourself with as an entrepreneur... They need something from you. And that's not a bad thing. But if you construct your entrepreneurial organization in such a way and you have a tremendous amount of responsibilities, you might have to spend all of your life force tending to those responsibilities and none of it tending to the responsibilities of your family, the responsibilities of your health, the responsibilities of your community. And so you start to get caught into a trap in entrepreneurship. And I know many entrepreneurs. And in fact, we as entrepreneurs are two times uh, more likely to suffer from mental uh, health, 10 times more likely to be uh, addicted. I mean, there's stats to support this, that entrepreneurship is a very difficult profession. Part of the reason why is because we bear the risk and then no one teaches us. There's no school system that teaches you how to bear risk and innovate and build businesses. You get put into a school system. I have a son as well. I have to argue with you know, his teachers and people in school. You get put into a school system where they're like, here is the vocation that you're being groomed into so that you can go be a cog in the wheel for someone else. There's no one teaching entrepreneurs how to run effective meetings, how to lead, how to build culture, how to wake up in the morning, how to overcome challenges, how to deal with, you know, customer challenges, how to deal with organizational challenges. There's just, there's no school for that. There's only a school to teach you how to be a good student so that you can be a good employee. So that way you can, you know, uh, participate in the system of capitalism. And so we're a school for entrepreneurs. Oh, okay. It makes sense to me now. And I understand it. You know, um, I love biographies a lot. Um, I've been, I have anxiety. I think everyone has anxiety, but I like, I actually have anxiety uh, as an entrepreneur and ADHD and all those things you talk about. I have my own addictions and stuff. And I often wonder if, if we become entrepreneurs and then develop these things, or frankly, entrepreneurship is the path for us because the system just does not work for us. Um, but I'm working through these biographies of like people, um, you know, a hundred, a few hundred years ago. I finished Ben Franklin's biography. And what a remarkable man who yeah. uh, was able to do so, like, so many things other than all I, I'm like, oh, some dude who's on the $100 bill. I didn't realize just how anti establishment he was, which is what, frankly, like, he just did not want to uh he was just anti-establishment and that's what led to a lot of his success i'm reading einstein's biography right now and einstein was a terrible pupil and a terrible student and he refused to do <laughs> anything the way that his teachers wanted and they hated him 
And he didn't see much success for like, I think after he graduated from his class, he was the only person in his class not to get offered a professorship in, yeah. in Switzerland. And it took him nine years to get an entry level position because he was so hard to work with because he refused to look at the world the way that everyone else did. And so I'm going back in the past and learning all these lessons and reading all these things because, you know, for Ben Franklin, he felt that the highest form of spirituality, uh, you know, at the time, being in America, Christianity was the main driving force. But the highest form of spirituality was to use your gifts to help other people. And uh, J.D. Rockefeller felt that the reason he could be so cutthroat in business was because he was so pious in his faith. And he felt that yeah. God had ordained him to do yeah. great things. And he used that feeling of being like God ordained to make the biggest, boldest moves. And, you know, while early in his life, uh, Einstein who was Jewish, didn't have a lot of faith. Later, he came back to respect just the importance of it. And so when I talked about my own journey and being spiritual and whatnot, I think part of me has taken more spirituality or faith was more of an emotion. Mm -hmm. And the more that I've studied really successful people, I've realized that they've also not, you know, emotion is important, but how is this a framework to do good? Or how is this something that can serve others? Or how can we actually live up to the ideals and expectations that um, faith, because uh, I won't say religion, but faith might play on yeah. us? Well, the major religions all have uh, common values. And you'll find in, you know, in Christianity, the Muslim faith, um, uh, Judaism, uh, you'll find it in Hinduism, you'll find it in Buddhism, that ideas like humility are important. Now, how many entrepreneurs do we know uh, would do very well if they just learned the subject of humidity, humility? He goes and, the enemy. <laughs> right? You know, and believe me, I've lost a lot of money because of being, uh, of not being humble. So things like humility, things like compassion, things like love, things like joy, these are uh, religion was a system to try to create better people. And each of these systems did its best. I'm not criticizing it, did its best to create better people, basically. We are also trying to create better people, but we're trying to do so agnostic to these religious systems and just trying to help entrepreneurs get involved in a system to become their very best self and to actualize their full potential. The, I had anxiety too, and you mentioned anxiety. I had lots of challenges as an entrepreneur with mental health. I took on a tremendous amount of responsibility because my company grew so fast. I was not prepared for the level of responsibility that I got to very quickly. So you took over, I don't know the exact year, but you took over um, yeah. a, a network marketing, multi-level marketing company. It, you were made the CEO of it. And within kind of two or three years, it was what, like $6 million in debt or something? Yeah, I, I took it over. We were doing about 20,000 a month and then we built it to about two and a half million a month and then sold it in a multi year, um, uh, earn out. And, uh, we were doing about 500,000 a year in EBITDA at that, that time. And so, uh, a publicly traded company acquired us in a multi year earn out scenario. And then we ran the company from, well, we went, uh, to six million in debt during the recession. So we went from two and a half million a month to $600,000 a month. We we're losing about 600,000 a month. We accumulated 6 million in debt and then we turned it around and it then became the fastest growing company in Wall Street and ran to, uh, 635 million in sales, 100 million in profit. And the, uh, earn out. So, ended up so, so you end up, you gloss over that pretty quick. I hope, I hope the listeners heard that 600 plus million dollars. <laughs> yeah. These are massive numbers. Yeah. They're big numbers. Yeah. And a hundred million in profit. A lot of people will tell you about their sales volume. Like real estate agents often do 600 million in profit. Uh, sorry, 600 million in, in total volume, but yeah, yeah. you know, the profits 1% of in, that. In, are, info products also do this. They're like $65 yeah. million dollars in info products, but they spend $64 million in advertising. <laughs> yeah. Right. So like, you know, the, I think the profit measure tells you about the skillfulness of the entrepreneur, but certainly 635 million in any company is not an easy thing to do. Um, but we were able to do that and maintain a, you know, a very uh, healthy and significant profitability and far above the averages of what our industry, you know, was able to do during that period of time. Um, but, you know, I went from having 20 employees, uh, that were working with me and maybe a few full time people in my field to having 3000 plus full time people in my field and 580 employees in 24 months. 
So I now had the stewardship for, you know, 3000 plus, uh, full time people and 150,000 part time people. I wasn't ready for that. I made a lot of mistakes. I thought my success came from, uh, my brilliance and my intelligence. I didn't realize, uh, many of the root drivers of my success. And I've, you know, spent a lot of time contemplating this and thinking about this and designing my new business, my, my venture alter call, uh, based on all of the learnings and lessons that I learned from that. But, you know, I, during that period of time, I made a lot of mistakes and I made personal mistakes. I made, um, uh, leadership mistakes. I made entrepreneurial mistakes. And I, you know, I can proudly tell you that, you know, I've probably, uh, made hundreds of millions of dollars worth of errors as an entrepreneur. And as a result of that, I've learned some very powerful lessons. And that's also what I teach my entrepreneurs. It's like, don't make the same mistakes that I did. You have the, that when you're working with me, you have the benefit of the fact that I've spent $2 billion. That's the cumulative revenue. I've invested $2 billion into experimentation. And in that experimentation, I brought back a lot of lessons, a lot of principles, philosophies, practices, and methodologies that I now apply to my business and the many businesses that I support. So is Alter Call... And I'm going to ask a super leading question here now, but I feel like I have to because otherwise I'll be too uncomfortable to ask it. <laughs> so two years ago, uh, you and I actually connected and spoke on a clubhouse room. And we spoke ah. in pretty good detail and you were very transparent and you were very open. Uh, I think it was you and me and Evan were there. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and it was... Uh, and you were presenting your, like just exactly how you are now. Um, very reasonable. Um, and it totally... like it, It's awesome. And I'm like, I trust you and I believe you. But you know, when you built up your first company in network marketing, in multi-level marketing, I have an issue with network marketing and multi-level marketing. And maybe I bring a bias to it. But I kind of feel like it's an immoral industry that it's not... A, it's a real business for the people running the business. But you make money off of selling stuff to the people who are your distributors. They are your main source of income. And most often, your distributors are not people who are... They're savvy enough to buy into it, the dream. Uh, so... For one, that's not true, but there are some companies, certainly, that their entire objective is to sell. They make their money off of selling their distributors. There's okay, well, a lot of legal regulation around this. And because we're a publicly traded company, we have to be very careful about that. There are customer companies out there that have customer acquisition models. They're not actually wholesaling to their distributors. They're actually selling directly to the customers. Their distributors are acting as referral agents, basically. But if we look at the, the rise and fall of your company, yeah. you had a tremendous amount of rise post 2008 when the recession you know, hit. And, and I come from a world of franchising and sales and what have you. And I know that when there's mass layoffs, that there's more opportunity to be able to sell products and franchising and other things because you've packaged something with the idea that someone can generate wealth or generate a business or move into this without any of the quote unquote hard work. But the company saw a tremendous amount of revenue. And then you sold it in 2012. And then in, in 2013 and in the first two quarters of 2014, it's operating at a loss. And it was like this rise and fall in terms of revenue. Um, now, we could say that every brand has a rise and fall. Every business has a rise no, and fall. I, that you business is cyclical. What, if you want to know what happened to the company, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you. Uh, we screwed up. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a function of our products or our business model. It was a function of our, our youth and inexperience in running a multinational gigantic company. And, uh, and a function of our own egos and a variety of other things. The, the other thing that was a mistake that we made, and I, in retrospect, I could, if I could go back in time and do things differently, I would. We got a lot of people really wealthy quickly, myself included. And when you take a person that maybe has, you know, making 3000 a month and now they're making 200000 a month and they're not prepared for that, and they're making that money not by the merits of their efforts, but rather by the system that has been built. And the ego gets involved. There's all kinds of bad decisions that we made that were leadership oriented, that were self-sabotaging decisions, that were based on ego and wealth accumulation and greed. Like, like what? Like what? Let's get specific. Because it caused the parent company's you know, share price to fall from $40 a share down to like nine fifty dollars a share in 24 well, it was, months. It was, so. The parent company's uh, share price when they bought us was like $5 a share and we ran it to $40 a share. <laughs> okay. so I was responsible for that $40 <laughs> share price, not them. Um, and then, and you know, just so you understand, we were the number one profit driver of the parent company. When they bought us, we were nothing to them. We are a write-off. And then we built it in such a way 
that we became the number one profit driver, so forth. The parent company made a lot of mistakes too. They're not, uh, you know, um, they have some responsibility here too. When they acquired us, they didn't have the money to write us the check. So they had to, uh, borrow money. And then they was had to leverage buyout, was it? They, yeah. They had to leverage it. And then they had to extract all the cash in our bank account. I was against it. And then they tried to force us to go public, which I, you know, I didn't like, but I got persuaded into it. My ego loved the idea of going public. So like in retrospect, we should have never taken a company, tried to take a company public that only had just started to, you know, discover Dude, itself. You were the exact, like, oh man, if we could go back in time, someone should have handed you small giants and said, right? like, read this book. <laughs> no, I'm, you know, and it, but you know, they told me that basically they I had a deal with the devil. Basically, I'll never forget. He sat down with me and he said, the CEO of that company and he said, you know, what do you want so we could take this company public? And he's like, you were going to become the CEO of an NYSE or NASDAQ publicly traded company. And, you know, and my ego was like, that sounds great. And so my requirement was I needed a jet. I needed this. I needed that. You know, I wrote up my list of what was required. They said deal. And then we marched the company to a publicly uh, public offering and the whole thing blew up. And then the company was in turmoil because of that decision. Now that said, that doesn't mean that that is the only factor in our, uh, you know, our fall, but that was one of the big things. You know, we marched the employees, we marched the distributors, we marched everybody to a publicly traded offering, and then it blew up on us. Um, and then when that happened, the publicly traded company had to gut all of our cash in order to pay us the buyout. And so there was greed and there was all kinds of crap going on that, you know, distrust between the parent company and us. They tried to, you know, play games with us. They didn't give us the respect we deserved. And then we, of course, our egos were inflated gigantically because, you know, we're number one company in our industry. We're making all this money. You know, me and my co-founders are making tens of millions of dollars, buying mansions, flying on private jets. All that stuff just destroyed the ethos of what made us great in the first place. But all that revenue and all that money, did that not come at the backs and the cost of your distributors and regular people? Well, no, it was customer driven. So our business model, we had what was called the body by buy 90 day challenge. So that money was a direct correlation to helping people lose weight. We were a weight loss company. So we had measured that we helped take something like 500 million pounds off of people. So people would, uh, and we were a very simple model. We were the first to take a challenge and market it on social media. So we were doing things different. We were a very uh, uh, specific uh, customer-focused model. Now, we did make a lot of mistakes. Don't get me wrong. Uh, many, As we started growing and we were seeking growth, um, many of our leaders wanted to pursue more opportunity-centric um, uh, you know, uh, messaging. I was against it. I got overruled in some cases. The heart behind what made us great, though, was helping people lose weight, right? Helping them join a challenge with their friends and family as customers, not just distributors, put on weight, lose pounds, share it with their friends. Our referral model was if you got three people to join you, not as distributors, but as customers, we shipped you your product for free. And that created a beautiful uh, viral customer acquisition engine. And that's what made us different than the Amways that are just basically selling opportunity. Now, as we got more successful and we started bringing on industry professionals, the messaging shifted to opportunity. And I think that was another key contributor to the fact that we fell apart. The company was sold to a group called Prove It. My co-founder, Blake Mallon, runs that company today. So many of our products and our systems and our technology live on. So it wasn't a total waste. It went on, you know, it didn't go to zero basically, but it was painful, certainly. And I learned a lot of lessons from that. Now, I do want to address something though. When you said, uh, you know, you're against uh, direct selling and network marketing. I think direct selling and network marketing has its place. Otherwise, you know, it, it wouldn't work and it, it has its place. It teaches a lot of people fundamental entrepreneurship. It teaches a lot of people to start thinking about, you know, the skills of an entrepreneur, specifically sales and marketing. There's a benefit to that. Like if you spend $500 to join a network marketing company and all you learn is some skills of sales and marketing and you never are successful, that's better than spend $500 on most of the courses that exist on the internet today where you actually never apply the skills that you learn from these quote unquote gurus. They tell you stuff. 
and you never actually have a real world application. And many of the courses are much more than $500 to learn sales and marketing from some of the esteemed colleagues that you and I both uh, know very well. So, you know, I wouldn't say that network marketing is a bad thing by any uh, means. However, there are companies that I believe do not do it right. And I believe there's a lot to be learned from the errors that we made at Vaisalas that, you know, the industry certainly has adjusted to and applied as are lot, there's a lot to be learned by many other, uh, you know, uh, failures and errors that occurred in the industry. But I will tell you, I chose not to go back into network marketing for a reason, right? Because I of all people could have started another network marketing company. Right. And yeah, most do, right? It's the rise and fall. <laughs> right. I made a hundred million dollars in profit. I had contacts, distributors, supply chain, uh, executives, like, you know, if any, the easiest thing for me to have done to become a billionaire would have been to start another network marketing company, do it right this time and do it in such a way that, you know, that I, I reaped all the gains without having to share it with uh, a corporate partner that, you know, didn't know what the hell they were doing. And they literally didn't. The company, Blythe, <laughs> the company that bought us no longer exists today. So okay. clearly they didn't know what they were doing. Um, so that, that said, you know, when I look at it, the reason why I didn't do it, and this is, personal thing. And it's not that it's a bad industry. But I felt that I wanted to create intimacy in my relationships. And in my rise as an entrepreneur, I did not value relationships or intimacy in relationships. It was about me trying to be successful. And everyone else was just, you know, a byproduct of that. We were in relationship for as long as, you know, we could make money together and be successful together. That was the way I viewed the world. And that's a product of the way that I was raised. I didn't have a strong relationship with my parents, my siblings, you know, relationships were not valued in my, my, my life and family. Now, as I've gone on my spiritual journey, I now value and covet relationships. And so I don't want to participate in a business model that could ever exploit relationships. And I believe that a lot of network marketing does exploit relationships and it teaches people how to exploit their relationships. And it does it in such a way where you cannot have 100% compliance. So there, there always is pain in the system of any network marketing company because you don't know how to teach a person how to properly create relationships and cultivate and nurture relationships and try to monetize them. Those are mutually exclusive things, right? You can't try to monetize your mother and your father and try to monetize relationships all day long and cultivate and nurture them in such a way where you have intimacy, shared values, and you know building really healthy relationships. So I'm not in the industry. I don't uh, uh, want to uh, you know, say that I'm against the industry by any means, but I'm only for cultivating relationships in such a way where they're lasting and they're held as sacred. Network marketing does not treat relationships as sacred. It treats them as something that should be monetarily exploited. I will give you that I had not considered that if you approached... So, so you know, I'm lucky enough to come... Like, I'm a fifth-generation entrepreneur. Now, when I started my business, I was not an entrepreneur. I was a small business owner because we didn't use the word entrepreneur until about 8 or 10 years ago. But, uh, you know, I'm a fifth-generation. I've watched people have the rise and have the fall and have the really good times and have the really hard times. And I hung out with entrepreneurs and there was just always this idea in my head where it's like, if I want to do my own thing, I could. And so I understand that there's like this privilege that I have where it's like, yeah. cool. I'm like a middle-class white guy in Canada in, in a big city that's well-educated who's watched other people do it. Yeah. And it was never more clear to me how important some of these gateway things are that frankly, I kind of judge. Yeah. Except for last May, so a year ago, I was down in Raleigh um, for Ed Milet's book launch, uh, Power of One More. Mm. And I was helping kind of behind the scenes through a friend. Um, and I got to spend the day like... <laughs> I remember, you know, I'm in the green room and there's like Dean Graziosi and, and Marie Forleo and uh, uh, Quick and uh, John, the guy who's in multi-level marketing, who everyone knows. I forget his last name now. Anyway, there's all these great people there and I'm spending the day and I'm watching them and I'm learning and I'm just like, I'm there... I'm there to like sweep the floor. I'm there to like, yeah. I got Ed coffee when he came in, right? Like <laughs> yeah. I helped my friend Steven Scoggins, whose event it was in Raleigh, like set up the pole and drape. Like I'm just there to be a part of it. And I'm flying home uh, and I'm feeling really down. Like being around all these people made me feel so small 
and so insignificant. And when I watched Ed Milet speak, I was like, damn, the gap between where I am as a communicator and where he's just yes. like, you know, and then I Googled him and I was like, oh, well, he's been speaking since 1995. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> came by way of many network marketing meetings. There, <laughs> one, one of the things that we failed to do in our society, we see someone who has great enunciation, is articulate, can speak, hold the energy of a room, passionately go to places within them. We see that and we just think, you know, oh, th- th- there's no skill there. We just think they're born that way. And Ed Milad is a testament to the fact that network marketing trained him to be the leader that he is today. No doubt about it. Yeah. And uh, I looked around the room and as we were speaking, I had tears in my eyes and, I've, and you know, other people are crying. And it's just yeah. like, what a powerful man. But so I just have this experience and I'm, and I get up the next day and I'm just feeling so down. And, you know, I'm going to fly home back to Toronto. And um, whenever I travel alone for business, I always book business class uh, because, you know, you can use the Wi Fi and all of this stuff. It makes sense for me. And so I'm getting in the Uber and there's this awesome man. There's this awesome dude and his wife. And uh, it, I'm like their first Uber customer ever. And he's driven an hour into Raleigh and it's him and his wife because they're trying to try Uber out. And I've heard so many bad things about Uber, right? Like if you're going to start a business, why would you start an Uber business? Like, like you're going to just work and it's hard to play the system and you can't make money. And it's just like a bit like multi-level marketing for me. I'm like, why would you do that? Like, just go start a real business. And this man is telling me about, you know, his five kids uh, and I have four kids and he's just super friendly and he's talking about the market and he drove up an hour from Fayetteville to, on this Saturday to try and test it out. And I was like, well, why, what, like, what are you doing? And why do you want to get into it? And he's like, hey, man, I just need to, I need to figure out a way to replace my income. Yeah. So, because my job sucks and my boss sucks and there's no career and I have no path and I just need to try something. And then we're talking. He's like, oh, you're going to the airport. I said, yeah, I'm flying back. He's like, oh, I've never been on a plane before. I was like, um, oh, really? And he's like, yeah, I've been to New York once. And this man's in like his 40s or 50s. I've been to New York once to visit some family, but otherwise, yeah, I've just mostly been in North Carolina. And just the friendliest man. And I felt pretty <laughs> I felt pretty shitty because I'm like, what's my problem? Right? Like, like, like honestly, you know, like I just had this great event where I met with all these people. I he's driving me to the airport so I can go back to see my friends or sort of see my family. I'm taking a business class flight back to so that way I can get back to my agency, to my world, to my business. And I'm like, and it changed. I realized I live in a completely different world for most people. Like we live in a completely different world for most people. And you know what? Uber is an awesome way to get into entrepreneurship if that's your only way. And perhaps to your point, MLM is an awesome way to get into entrepreneurship if it's your only way, or maybe real estate investing or whatever it is, right? Or, like take or, the or, course or, and pursue it. Or you want to craft and cultivate presentation skills. You know, that's, uh, you know, like, so it's not the only way, but there, it certainly suits a certain personality archetype very well. Right. And it's, it can be fun. You can travel. Like there's a lot of benefits to doing that business and to learning that methodology. So I think that, you know, if my son came to me and said that I have no idea what I want to do, but I want to sell vitamins or I want to, you know, do this, that, or the other, I'd say that's a great experiment for you to try to learn what you want to do out of life. And, you know, period. So there, I, you know, it's suitable to certain people. Um, and it, it suits them very well. Certain individuals, they love it. They love the stage. They love contributing to others. They love getting out there and sharing their heart, sharing their story. And, you know, I tell you that my public speaking skills came by way of, you know, 3000 network marketing speeches. Where else would I have booked 3000 speeches? So I built a system and a model. You know, we sold out stadiums. We filled up American Airlines Arena with 18,000 people. I would never have the speaking skills, the presentation skills, all of this, if I hadn't done 3,000 speeches by way of the network marketing model. This is this is my challenge. Is I'm so good at devil's advocate. I could always yeah. see both sides of everything. And I'm like, huh. So... So let me ask you. So Alter Call comes after uh, a decade, you know, post, you know, you're, you're all of that rise and fall and all the craziness is a decade in your past. Um, and we have Alter Call now. Is this your chance for redemption? Is this the penance that you're paying or is this yes. coming on the heels of, <laughs> is this coming on the heels of all the ego crushing and spiritual work you've done where it's like so obvious to you that this is the missing piece? Yeah, it is 100% me trying to get favor with our Heavenly Father. Okay, so I screwed up. 
made a lot of mistakes. Now I'm going to fix it, and I'm going to uh, try to sew into as many human beings as well, possible. You're, you're smiling now. Are like, are you joking, or is that no, seriously? No, like- it's the truth. No, I'm smiling because it's the absolute truth. Okay, I, I made a deal with God. You know, I, I went through a really difficult time. I stepped down as CEO of Alter Call in late 2016. My of mother. Alter Call? I'm sorry, not Alter Call. I stepped oh. down as CEO of Vicellus in late 2016. Okay. Uh, my mother um, uh, had been in a coma for two years, and she's about to transition. She had woke up miraculously, but I knew that she was about to die. She just went on hospice. My son was struggling from uh, autism, and it was a very difficult, extreme situation for our family. I had run my health to the ground, you know, partying, being an idiot, um, didn't take care of my health during, you know, the, the this period of time. And I just said, I'm done with this, I'm done with this way of life. And, you know, I had a, an ego death, as one might say, and looked myself in the mirror when my mother passed away and said, with her by my side, I will do everything that I can with her by my side in spirit. I will do everything that I can to be the leader that I'm capable of. And I knew that, you know, from my spiritual beliefs, that my mom can now see me clearly. And she knew that the son that she had was up to nefarious activities, not doing the best that he possibly could. And so I wanted to honor her. I wanted to honor the love that she gave me. And I wanted to repent and restore my relationship with God. And I wanted to do good on the planet and spend the rest of my life doing that. It's been an adventure. I had no idea how I was going to do it. I didn't know what the name of the company is going to be. I didn't know anything, but I started taking action and rebuilding my entrepreneurial skills from the ground up with these new values and this new spiritual identity that I had uh, received upon my mother's passing. How did, how did that death of your ego play out? And how did that that moment of looking in the mirror like what did you have to tell yourself like this is a really big change so you know yeah. <laughs> i wanted to call it a come to jesus moment but this is a really yeah, big change it, right it was a it was a literal come to jesus moment for sure the um you know so my mom's about to pass away and i'm getting the chills all over me just sharing this with you and i've been struggling doing drugs partying drinking you know uh living a very playboy decadent life and I went to her and I got a word and I had never had anything this clear come to me before. And the word was, go say goodbye to your mother. And I was like, what? You know, we're going to have Thanksgiving together. It's going to be, I don't, why should I go say goodbye to my mom? I don't even want to, don't even want to do this. This is crazy. And I went and told her that, you know, I had a word that she won't be around on Thanksgiving. And I told her that. And then I confessed to her and shared with her all the challenges that I was going through. How I could not bear the pain of seeing her in the state that she was in, deal with my son's autism, uh, dealing with career issues, that if she continued in a state, it was going to kill me. And she looked at me and, you know, she said, okay. And a few days later, she was gone. And it was a shock to my system because we had made a soul contract, a deal that she would elevate so that I could live. Because in her state, the way she was severely handicapped, half her skull removed, tubes everywhere, in and out of the ICU, uh, having to have someone change her 24-7. I mean, it was a really... How did she end up in that state? Fell down a flight of stairs and uh, mm-hmm. had a severe brain trauma and was two years in a coma where I was by her bedside for two years. And then by the grace of God, I prayed with her nonstop. Right as I was about to take her off of life support, she woke up. And I had about another four years with her where she was in severely handicapped state and, you know, severe trauma and really challenging. But by the grace of God, I got to have, you know, an extended time with my mother, although, you know, in a a difficult situation. Um, And that was seven years worth of just pressure cooker on top of me. And I was distracting myself from that pain, the pain of my son's autism. And I was putting everything I could into trying to pursue profits and make money and be somebody. In the meantime, my personal life was filled with pain. So I couldn't go home for a minute and address my personal life without just being in extreme pain. And so I got out of my house as much as I possibly could, got on the road, built the company, built my success because I was running from pain. And then when my mom dies, I have no company. I'm out, you know, as CEO of the company, I'm gone. My friends don't want anything to do with me because, you know, I no longer am 
flying them around in private jets and taking them on lavish vacations and drinking and bringing uh, party people around. And so the friend group that I cultivated was like, this guy's no longer cool. But He's you have cool. millions and millions of dollars. Wasn't it all worth it? <laughs> um, it wasn't. I was, uh, I, I made a deal with my creator and my faith. I said, I'll burn this money. I'll light it all on fire if that's what you want me to do. I'll sell my house. I'll become a barista at Starbucks if that's what you want me to do. I was done with the way of living and being I cultivated as an entrepreneur for about 20 years. That way of living and being was an unhealed way of living and being. It was trying to prove that I was enough. I had a chip on my shoulder. I want to prove my father wrong. I want to prove anybody who wanted to compete with me wrong. It was not spiritually aligned way of being. It did come with monetary gain, but that monetary gain was not worth uh, whatsoever worth the mistakes and the transgressions that conspired as a result of the unhealed way of being that I was operating with. And so I spent two years healing, uh, diving into breath work, diving into meditation, diving into sound healing, going on hikes. I detached myself from business as a whole. I walked away from the identity of being an entrepreneur. And I thought, maybe I'm done with this. Maybe I'm going to go, you know, go work for somebody. Maybe I'm going to. Be a barista. I don't know, but I'm not going to do this anymore. And slowly but surely, as I began to heal, I started to realize that I could bring the healing that I had learned to others. And that's the deal that I made. I said to my creator, I said, God, if you help me heal, I'll help others heal as well. And what I've come to learn is that healing and growth go together. You cannot have one without the other. So in order for you to grow, you have to heal. In order for you to heal, you have to grow. And so that's been my mission ever since. But it came as a result of a very dark night of the soul. And that, you know, that was a beautiful thing because when you hit rock bottom, that's when you really get to find out who you are. And that's when you really get to find out about your relationship with your higher power. And that's when you begin to climb again. And so while I still had assets and I still had money, when I hit rock bottom, I had no friends I had no support. I was in dire straits. I was angry. I was triggered. I was blowing up left and right. You know, I was just a mess. And from that mess, I started to develop a message. And from that mess, I started to, you know, uh, just discover who I really was and then start to take action for it. And it was not hard. You know, it was starting from scratch on me, on everything that I thought I knew. I had to throw it out the window and start over. How did you rebuild your confidence? It, that was tough. I wasn't confident enough to re- look at my SMSs during this period of time. I wasn't confident enough to email during this period of time. I was ashamed of who I was. I had guilt. I went through lots of, of reputational uh, uh, catastrophes. Like I was confidence level negative 100 in comparison to the artificial confidence that I thought I had where I, you know, I could command a stage and sit on TV and tell people, you know, blah, blah, blah. I went to negative 100. And what I learned was that my adversity that I had gone through, and it was a lot and more than most people will ever endeavor, you know, to go through in a lifetime. And certainly prior to being an entrepreneur, I had a lot of adversity. And then as an entrepreneur, I created a lot of adversity. And then now I'm at the peak of adversity. I realized that adversity was my authority. That adversity was the fuel for the character and the competency that I would build going forward. And it was one, you know, action at a time, one book at a time, one meditation at a time, one, uh, uh, activity at a time until I started building a confidence level to where I could start to build and scale a business again. And now I have, you know, a company that's uh, growing and scaling, you know, to the same rate that uh, Vice Alice did in its early days. So I have something that you know, I built that, you know, I'm working with, you know, renowned scientists building artificial intelligence, uh, helping entrepreneurs, doing what I love and working with people that I love. But I share that story with you because I want anyone listening to know that you can start over at any time. I had to start over at 40. And I had to start over and I had to start over with a deficit. And now I'm, you know, I'll tell you, I have the love of my life. I'm, you know, I have a great team members. I'm doing inspiring work. I'm happy. I'm joyful and I'm growing every single day. So you can do anything as long as you really turn to those values deep inside of you and you start to express yourself through them. And so I'm left wondering, uh, you know, the more I study 
rock star rise and fall of the entrepreneur, the more like the, the more I hear the same story of it was a wild ride that was <laughs> not sustainable. And I almost wonder if the drugs and like all of the stuff that entrepreneurs who are under so much pressure have to do before they burn out, you know, like just the crazy life that you have to live is the only way to suppress all of those normal feelings of fear and doubt and the risk and everything else. And the only entrepreneurs who can do that for a long period of time must be like narcissists or like there, there must be something within them where they can somehow compartmentalize or detach themselves to the point where they're just like, it doesn't bother them. Um, and so I've seen this rise and fall so many times. I've seen how short lived these windows of times are. And we can look at, we can look at, uh, uh, people in Hollywood. We could look at musicians, like look at what, yeah. look at how long the Beatles lasted seven years. Like there's the rise and fall of so many things because people just get so burnt out. So the question I have though is, can you, in your mind, can you achieve that level of success, uh, the right way with without all of those things? Or should we start to talk about how people admire these entrepreneurs, these leaders, these businesses that are that we don't even realize are coming at such an internal cost? And it's yeah. so short lived and it's not building legacy that like we should stop putting these things on a pedestal because it's the like the burn, it like you're gonna burn out so quickly. And we should really be talking about the very slow careful, methodical path to business growth? Well, you know, I'll play devil's advocate with you. <laughs> yeah, let's um, go. <laughs> yeah, let's go. I, this is, I know this is your love language here. The, you know, I love, the, I've never the, heard of devil's advocate as a love language. That's your love language. <laughs> I'm with you, brother. Um, you know, the rock star serves a role. And we need those stories. They're interesting. They're inspiring. There's a lot packaged in those stories like the rise and fall and the failure. And, you know, and we need to learn those lessons. And so each archetype, I wanted to be a rock star, you know, growing up as a kid by our program, by our popular media, rock stars and rap stars and athletes and celebrities were great. I was nor an athlete or a singer or a dancer or an actor. And so I got there by way of network marketing and entrepreneurship, right? Like I wanted to be a rock star. I lived that life. I did rock star stuff. I did all kinds of rock star stuff. I got every rock star story you can imagine that runs its course, even for the rock stars, right? So there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to go out there and be a rock star, you're, you know, it's a painful way of living, but you know, you only live once. Go try it. I, I, like you're going to learn some deep, valuable lessons from it. I think that we tend to judge and we tend to try to weigh things as good or bad. And nothing is good or bad. It's like it, the good things turn out to be bad things. The bad things turn out to be good things. And we'll just see the right attitude to have is let's just extract as much as we possibly can from these people. Let's not idolize them. Let's study them. Let's learn from them and then take their best practices, leave behind their worst practices. And then, you know, those things that we identify with and we think are best practice, take them and, uh, you know, uh, cultivate them in our own lives and our own entrepreneurial endeavors. So, you know, I wanted to be a rock star. And so I created a rock star system and it, it worked and I got to experience what it was like to be a rock star for a period of time. Now I want, you know, like you, I want to have a legacy where my grandchildren's grandchildren uh, know that, you know, great, great grandpa did inspiring work on the planet and did some good and, you know, and left some wisdom and some love behind. And that's it. I'm not looking to be a Rockefeller and, you know, create a name that exists, you know, throughout history. I'm just trying to leave some love and wisdom behind. Final question for you. Uh, with everything that you've done and everything that you're doing, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? It all comes down to love. So I'll share with you. This is, I do a lot of thinking and I'm blessed to be in a position where I get to do that. I, and I've done a lot of experimenting and I'm, you know, patient zero basically. And now I've worked with many others. If you have love, romantic love, if you have family love, if you have children, like love of a child, if you have love of nature, if you have love of your work, then you will love life. If you have a deficit of love in any of the quadrants, and there's others, but any of those quadrants that I mentioned, then life is not going to be fully actualized and you're not going to extract the most meaning out of it. But if you have love in all those categories, you're going to show up different. You're going to wake up different. You're going to have 
a different experience in life. And ultimately, at the end of your days, we're all working toward the same goal. And that is that at the end of our days, we look back and say, I'm satisfied with the conclusions I've come to and the lessons that I've learned and the life that I've lived. And you will not be satisfied if you have 10 billion in the bank, but no love. You will not be satisfied if you have 10 billion in the bank and your children hate you. You will not be satisfied if you have 10 billion in the bank and, you know, and you never got to experience true romantic love or true love of others or true love of service, right? Or true love of nature. You will not be satisfied. I guarantee you that I've met many people, Paul Allen, the founder of Microsoft, the end of their days, they were not satisfied, even though they had materially a great existence. That's why I lead people to really look at life spiritually, because at the end of our days, we're all going to be at the same place asking the same question. It's like, did I do it right? And my goal is to answer that question of, you know, yeah, I did everything I came here to do. 